Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. From beautiful San Miguel de Allende, smack in the middle of Mexico, with your host, Jonathan Lockwood and James Guzman. Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, the podcast that answers the question, where are interesting people doing interesting things in interesting places? My name is Jonathan Lockwood. I'm here with James Guzman. How you doing, James? You know, I'm doing really well today. We got a, a couple of things to celebrate today. What's that? Well, number one, we have the uh, Mexican Independence Day here Oh, that's today, right. right. Yeah. The uh, Centro is full of people. It's quite a lot of parties and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, then number two, you know, we both have shriv- survived the Shemitah. So, you know, that's... Oh, my God. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> You know, We're I still had alive, meant, but he's still here. I meant to set a clock on yeah. that, and uh, I, I forgot all about it. Yeah, so no I'll, need to, no need to worry. We can we can continue with our lives, and uh, I think everything's going to be all right. Whew. Okay, very good. Well, um, I'm very excited myself because uh, the guest that we had on it. It's so funny because you mentioned him to me. This was James found our guest, and uh, and then I went well, online actually, and I found it. I'm what, sorry, let it? me let me jump oh, in there. Ahead, sure, uh, Mark Peters. I want to give him. Oh. Uh, a shout out because he was the one that that hooked this up. I think he's part of Taylor's. Uh, uh, it's a launch group or something like that. So he he put us in touch, and uh, I tell you what, he was he was right. We're, me and you are both uh, fans of the James Altucher yeah. podcast, and then I noticed he was on there and uh, started reading his book. And wow, it was uh, it was a good find. Yeah, it was funny because you mentioned the name out, and I went I I, I googled. The, Googled him and found another interview. And I'm like, I know that voice. And I'm like, oh, Altucher had him on not long ago. So our guest today is Taylor Pearson. He is a systems obsessed entrepreneur, marketer, and philosopher, and author of the new best selling book, The End of Jobs. Welcome, Taylor Pearson, to the Borderless Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thank you for the excellent intro. If I can pay y'all for that in the future, that would be terrific. <laughs> You know, you can pay us all anytime you want, Taylor. <laughs> okay. We'll figure something out. Well, you low know, Taylor, bar- low barriers for that. Yeah. You know, Taylor, I want to thank you, first of all, for writing this book because, you know, I was thinking about writing a book and a lot of the stuff that you had in here was stuff that I wanted to write about. So I don't, I don't have to write this book anymore. Uh, I've told a couple of people, I think I kind of, I kind of snatched it out of the zeitgeist. <laughs> yeah. were, Thanks were, a lot, there Taylor. There were more than a couple of people that had Thanks thought a about lot, writing man. a similar book. <laughs> yeah, ruined our shit. Hey, let me, let me go ahead and read this little intro here too. Uh, so with reference to the end of jobs, you have some idea about what this is about, but Taylor spent the last three years meeting with hundreds of entrepreneurs from LA to Vietnam, Brazil to New York, and worked with dozens of them in industries from, uh, cat furniture to dating, helping them grow their businesses. Regardless of the industry, age, race, country, or gender, one simple fact stood out. Entrepreneurship was dramatically more accessible, profitable, and safer, while jobs were riskier and less profitable than the public is typically misled to believe. Based on hundreds of interactions and dozens of recent books and studies, he wrote The End of Jobs to show others how they could invest in entrepreneurship to create more freedom, meaning, and wealth in their lives. And, you know, this just sounds like the type of stuff that we talk about all the time. So thanks for writing this book. At what point did it strike you you should write this? So I was at a business conference in Bangkok uh, almost a year ago now. Um, and I said, I snatched out of the zeitgeist. I was talking with, uh, someone in a hallway after a presentation. Um, and we started like batting around this idea of like, why hasn't someone written a book about what's going on here? So we're standing in this, uh, the Conrad hotel in, uh, downtown Bangkok in this like nice amphitheater. And there's all these entrepreneurs and like, you know, it's a five, six day conference when you add in all the lead up meetings and like no one's got to, you know, call in sick for work to be able to go and everyone's flying halfway around the world is like, you know, how is this possible? How are all these people here? Um, how have they created businesses that have let them do this? Like what, what are the structural economic factors going on? Um, and so ended up hashing out basically the outline of the book, um, over the next two days of that conference and pitched it to a couple people there had them help me work on the outline and the initial uh, draft, and uh, was off to the races at that point. Fantastic! How long? When did? When was this released, Taylor? It wasn't that long ago, right? 
It came out uh, the beginning of July. So no, oh. very recently. So you've had kind of meteoric success here the last couple of months. It has. I, I did uh, a fair amount to kind of line up the marketing and, and put it in place, but it has moved um, much faster than I expected. And I think when I said I snatched out of the zeitgeist, I think I, there was a, a nerve there that I just happened to touch. Yeah. And there's a lot of different factors. I mean, you, you, it looks like you've done a good amount of kind of research and, uh, well, you've taken the time to put it all together and you know what a lot of people are thinking and talking about it, but you've put it together in kind of a comprehensive way and, uh, talked about the different, the different moves throughout the, the, I guess you want to call the, the different ages as far as from the agricultural to industrial to the, uh, information. And now we're going into a new one. Uh, maybe can you explain to, uh, the listeners what you see makes up this new, uh, economy that we're going into? Yeah. So I read, um, I read this book called the fourth economy. It's not very well known. The author is a brilliant, uh, a brilliant guy and did uh, very little marketing for the book. And it was kind of this aha moment. And it's kind of what I'm talking about that people talk about we're in the knowledge age, we're in the information age. And I, I don't think that's actually true anymore. Um, I think the 20th century was the, um, information age. I think I usually use the term knowledge, uh, knowledge age, knowledge era, and that since then, we are making this very stumbling, not so smooth transition um, into the entrepreneurial area. And that we saw the kind of the rise of the knowledge economy and the rise of the knowledge worker um, over the course of the 20th century, particularly in kind of that post-World War II, 1948 to 2000 uh, block of time with this huge expanse in, um, expansion in global wealth. The global GDP, the amount of wealth available globally, especially in kind of liberal Western democracies, uh, increased really dramatically. And then since then, um, things have slowed down substantially. You know, you could point to like 1980, 2000 is when things started to slow down in terms of like rises in real wages and rises in um, the knowledge economy. And that what is what needs to happen, in my mind, um, both on a societal level and as an individual level, is we need to make this jump from knowledge workers to entrepreneurs and that the scarce resource has gone from uh, knowledge, which was scarce in the 20th century and is becoming increasingly commoditized to entrepreneurship, which is, uh, I believe, the scarce resource of uh, certainly the first half of the 21st century. How prepared are most people, say, in the U.S. for the need for this leap? Very unprepared. Yeah, I think this is still a very uh, fringe um, movement in a lot of ways. Like you, I can imagine if someone got on CNN and said, you know, like we're no longer in the knowledge economy, everyone would go, oh, you're, you know, you're an idiot. Like, of course we're still in the knowledge economy. So I, I think it, this is still this idea of entrepreneurship as, as a new era, uh, a new life script, um, that's going to be broad in the way that, um, kind of knowledge work is today. I think we're still very, very early on. Yeah. You know, just to kind of give a recap, this is how I understood it, so maybe other people can understand it as well, is uh, there was a time when finance had, that was the most important thing in order for some, for uh, these businesses and for economies and society to move forward, they needed access to capital. This moved to, which was when the era of when banks were controlling everything. Now, uh, companies have, you know, they're basically uh, holders of this knowledge. CEOs and stuff like that. They're the ones that have a lot of control. And what you're saying now, and so a lot of, in this time was when everybody had this credentialism where people had to study and get credentials in order to be a part of this, a cog in this, uh, the large corporations. Uh, but now we're moving into, uh, you know, such a different economy where what's really valuable is people that can work in a more chaotic type of environment that can uh, try out new ideas in in a way that uh, they can risk less capital. And I think that it, rather than being credentialed in some certain uh, specific field, it's more of like a, a well-rounded uh, knowledge and, and the ability to take some risk. Would you say that that's more or less kind of the idea? Yeah, it's tricky. I, I take a shot at defining entrepreneurship in the book. And the way I usually define it is um, creation and connections. So it's taking existing resources, you know, the classic 
definition from uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, the French economist who coined mm. the term entrepreneur, was um, taking existing resources and repurposing them to, to higher and better uses. And so we've kind of gone from this period where um, a very, very small portion of the society, CEOs, had access to all the tools to be able to do that. Um, you know, if you like Henry Ford was um, was an entrepreneur and a, a CEO, and in order for him to run his business, right, he needed like a factory and hundreds of workers. You had to have like the tools of production were so capital intensive, um, and so you know people needed capital, and that's no longer the case, right? Like we're um, we're doing a radio interview right now. Um, and I, we probably all have at most uh, a few hundred dollars worth of equipment. And you know, to record this 30 years ago would have uh, required tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. Yes, right. Yeah, that's something that Jonathan talks about a lot, you know, especially in what he does with voiceovers uh, that, you know, before he had to go into actual, you know, he had to rent space at a <laughs> there, right to get a you, booth. You know, there was a guy I used to know who was a big voice talent. He used to do he he actually owned super spots in Chicago that did all that cutting edge MTV video uh, video in the 80s that changed everything. He told me now he told me this 20 years ago. He said back then in the 80s, the average invoice that went out on a video project was thirty two thousand dollars in the 80s. Today, for way less than $32,000, you can have the studio that does all that. And oh my God, today? <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable how inexpensive it is, but you're absolutely right. So I get your point. You know, this, this idea that people would think you're crazy for not being able to see the shift. One thing they should be able to see is that that path of education, career, accumulate assets is not working anymore. And it's not only not working for young kids, but it's not working for anybody really right now, is it? No, it's not. And I think that was kind of what I started to see maybe five years ago. Um, and in a lot of ways, the book was kind of written to myself five years ago. You know, I, I had a good degree. I had a good GPA. Like I, I ticked all the boxes that uh, kind of society um, told me I should tick. And I was like looking around at the options and I was like, this kind of sucks. Like mm -hmm. this does not look as, um, this does not look as appealing as I was kind of, uh, led to believe or silently led to believe. Um, and I think a lot of people have that sensation of like, you know, there, there are these implicit promises, um, that many of us, um, are made, uh, going through the traditional system and you, you get into the traditional system and you look around and like those implicit promises don't really seem to be. Uh, true. And I think I didn't mention this story in, in the book, actually, but um, my father is a physician and my sister's a physician and they're about 30 years apart. And they very follow, you know, it's a, you know, it's a very standard um, track to follow. You know, you go through med school and everything. Um, and when my father went through that, he graduated from med school in the 60s, um, worked most of his working life um, kind of in that, that late 20th century period. Um, and lived through this period where, you know, jobs were abundant and profitable. Um, and my sister got to a point in her career where she was about 40 years old. Uh, this was a few years ago. And she looked at the track and she goes like, this is not going to work out for me. Um, you know, I'm looking at like what my, what happened to my father and like, you know, Medicare slashing reimbursements. I'm seeing twice as many patients. I can't take good care of them. I've got half as much time, but I got to like stay on this treadmill. Um, and you're like, I have no control over how the insurance companies reimburse because they base their rates off Medicare. And so she went um, off the system and now does um, kind of concierge private medicine. Mm -hmm. um, again, to get into this like entrepreneurial aspect of medicine, and suddenly you know, she's starting to see more options, more opportunities. But she had to get out of that kind of traditional um, job-based mindset that most physicians have. Mm -hmm. True or false, you are making the point that moving toward entrepreneurship is risky but worth it. I think it depends how you define risky. I okay. think it is riskier in the short term if you want to talk like if you want to talk in terms of cash flow, I think any entrepreneur will tell you and I'll certainly tell you um, you know cash flow and um, cash flow in particular in the first early years of a business and even like profitability in the first three to five years of a business, uh, is, is a struggle and a lot of work. Um, I think if you're looking at longer time frames, you're looking at 10, 25 years, if you've got that kind of time left in your working life, 
I think suddenly that equation reverses, which is like all these shifts in how work is changing, like going back to the physici physician example, like Medicare will continue to slash reimbursement rates because they're broke. Um, and uh, they're not, that, that doesn't show signs of changing. So at some point, um, you're either going to have to make the leap or you're going to get crunched harder and harder and harder. So um, I think there is kind of this like three to five year period of learning entrepreneurship, becoming more entrepreneurial, getting a business off the ground. Um, that is a very risky uh, period, but that if you're going to be working for the next 20 years, you're going to have to do it at some point, And it's probably better to do it um, sooner rather than later. To me, that's that's one of the most important points that I make in reading through the material that I found on you is that it's better for us to begin thinking. It's not just that it's risky, but worth it. Sure, short term. It's actually long term going to be more risky if you don't move in that direction. Isn't that a primary point? Yes, I think so. And I think I I pick on accountants in the book because I have a lot of friends that are accountants. <laughs> um, and I the situation I worry about is um, people getting into an you know like an accountant that is in uh, in his or her twenties or thirties and is going to be like you know has thirty years left in their working life. Um, that like what we're seeing going on with technology, with outsourcing, with globalization, um, could very well get into this point, which should be peak earning years in their you know 40s or 50s, um, and they're all of a sudden the rug is going to be pulled out from under them. They have a family, a mortgage, you know, lifestyle expenses, and um, you know, the the industry or the the division in their company all of a sudden gets moved overseas or like, you know, you see very large downsizing because of uh, efficiency improvements in technology. Like you look, you know, Blockbuster was 60,000 employees, Netflix is 2,000 mm -hmm. uh, and they serve a larger marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and to have that rug pulled out from under you when you're, you know, 45, 50, peak earning years, family, et cetera, et cetera, is I think much riskier than um, making that move um, earlier on in your career. Uh, if that's an option. Yeah, I remember, uh, I think it was Robert Kiyosaki that I heard when I was really young saying that, uh, you know, people think it's risky to be an entrepreneur, but, you know, if you think about it, it's riskier to have all your income coming from one source rather than having, you know, multiple streams of income. Then, you know, uh, also with, with the way that we can have, like we're doing now podcasts or blogs or on social media and all this type of stuff, you can have lots of people and keep up different uh, types of, of relationships with people that might be able to sustain you rather than just, you know, you and your boss. And that's the only relationship. And once that's cut off, then you're done, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, this is something I've been thinking about since the book came out and I, I still have found a great way to articulate it, but there's this, there's definitely a difference between real and perceived risk. So like, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, there's lots of things I do where I, it feels very risky and it like, it feels very scary. Um, you know, and, and one of the things I, I sat down and I'll do periodically is like, okay, like, let's say this project I'm working on, you know, totally crashes, like Amazon's database gets wiped in the book, the IP from the book disappears forever. Um, or, you know, some kind of catastrophic thing like that happens. I can sit down and, you know, I can make a list of, um, five people I know that are entrepreneurs in my network that I can send an email to and say, Hey man, uh, things have gone really badly. This amazing, unforeseeable, catastrophic event happened. Um, you know, are you looking for anyone to come work with you on a project? And I, you know, I don't think there would be any issue in um, finding someone that would be willing to work with me on a project, you know, under those kind of terms. Right. Um, and, you know, someone that's an accountant that gets downsized where their network is primarily other people in um, accounting departments in their corporation or accounting departments in other corporations um, who are they going to send that email to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that makes sense. And, uh, you know, because you went out there and you started doing your own thing, you also learned a lot of skills that can then be, uh, you know, used with, with the, whatever new thing that you're looking to do or, or, you know, you could start your own business or like you said, talk to another entrepreneur or something like that. But these skills that you need to learn uh, in order to start one of these businesses are, are really the, the most valuable thing, I think. Yeah, skill sets and relationships mm -hmm. is how I typically think of it. Like, do you have a do you have a robust skill set that can handle changes in the market that is going to profit from the way things are shifting? And I think the entrepreneurial skill set 
um, is very much that skill set. And then, you know, the same question with relationships, you know, do you have relationships around you that are going to be profitable and be safe um, as, you know, we see technology and globalization and all these things move forward? Yeah, absolutely. So are there any specific skill sets that you could lay out to us that, you know, people may want to look in accumulating if they want to start being more entrepreneurial? If I had to pick somewhere to start, I, I usually would say marketing and sales. And if I was going to pick an order, I would say sales than marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I think whatever you do, um, you will benefit from having a a strong background in sales and marketing. At least that was that was kind of like my career hypothesis. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I figured, okay, whatever it is, um, if I can sell and market it, um, that'll make me that'll put me in a better position. Um, and I think you know like looking at the book and some of the other projects I've done that, that is true that, um, ha having sales and marketing and pairing that with almost any other skill set um, is a pretty effective place. So that's usually where I, where I push people or where I direct people to start thinking about acquiring entrepreneurial skills. Yeah. I like the quote that I found on you. It's what we're talking about right now. You, you lay it out there in one sentence. If you do things that are safe, but feel risky, you gain a significant advantage in the marketplace. So one reason for going the risky route is because everyone else thinks it's risky. Is that it? Yeah, there's sort of this like interesting like game theory of careers. Like because everyone perceives a certain path as safe, um, it becomes less and less safe. It, be like, it becomes more and more commoditized, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, and you know, as long as it, this happens in a lot of different markets and things, is when everybody kind of goes along with this uh, idea, it's just a perceived truth. And uh, even if it's obviously not true, but everybody agrees, kind of agrees on it, the majority of people agree on it, everybody agrees on it until it all falls apart. And they're like, yeah, I knew it wasn't true or whatever. Because then they can uh, at least just say, well, everybody else thought it was, you know. <laughs> and I think so. it's particularly tricky. Like you kind of talk about in, like intellectual reasoning and emotional reasoning that, um, you know, where I, I, for me, evolution is kind of like the light. It's like kind of the theory or the lens I see everything else through. And so, um, you know, you think about the guy walking across the savanna and he hears a wrestle in the bushes. Well, you know, nine out of 10 times, it's like probably a hedgehog and he could right. catch it and eat it or it's, yeah. you know, it's food, but one out of 10 times it's a lion. Um, and if he investigates all 10 of those times and the one time it turns out to be a lion, you know, he gets eaten like his genes are out of the gene pool. Right. And so like you, you hear the wrestling in the bushes um, and you your evolutionary brain kicks on and you think like even though it's probably good, um, it might it might actually kill me. Um, and so we you know, I, and I, I'm as guilty as anyone else um, when I'm not thinking about it. But you, you apply that same logic uh, to to a business and like I know people like to nine out of 10 small businesses fail, um, you know, but do they, does that destroy your career if you invest a couple hundred dollars in a website and testing out some um, marketing? Like, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't destroy your career. That's not a career death um, sentence or a career death move as it would be if you were, you know, living in the, the Savannah or, you know, even to be kind of less hyperbolic, but, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, if you want to open a business and you're taking out a large lease and you got to hire people, um, you're talking about like you're producing a video and it's going to cost you $32,000. And now it it's, you know, you put it up on iTunes or put it up on YouTube with your iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I liked a lot, uh, something that you went into, which was that, uh, software is eating the world. That this was a quote that was given by, I, I forget who it was that you said, uh, uh, who was that again? That the quotes from? That was uh, Mark Andreessen. Yeah, mm. and you gave specific examples. I liked how you you went down to the different industries that you don't really think about it. Um, so, for instance, uh, Amazon is you know is run by software, but that's basically you know selling all the things that, and taking away uh, well books. I think was you were, were you saying that Borders uh, <clears throat> sold that that their ebook uh, side to Amazon. And then you have Netflix, which took over for, you know, movie distribution, blockbusters and stuff like that. iTunes and uh, Pandora, places like that have taken over for kind of CD stores. Uh, Flickr and other places, you know, nobody ever gets a actual photo printed out. Uh, LinkedIn for resumes and, and actually headhunters and people like that. Uh, FedEx, even Walmart, you know, it's a 
logistics company. And all these companies are run just by software. Software has taken, uh, you know, jobs away from thousands and thousands of people. So I think that's very interesting. And I was just looking at a uh, article, I think it was this morning, about all about how WhatsApp is run and uh, by like nine people, you know, wow. and, it's, and it's it's like two billion people it serves or something like that. It's crazy. It's interesting. I uh, read an article after the book came out. Actually, maybe about a month ago, Amazon surpassed Walmart as the uh, largest retailer. Wow. Um, and they were saying that uh, Amazon, our uh, Walmart's like revenue per employee was around two hundred thousand dollars, like two hundred five thousand dollars, which I think is pretty typical for for traditional businesses that's usually the number you see and they were saying well you know amazon has much less uh you know their job to revenue ratio is much different it's around six hundred thousand in revenue per uh employee and they're kind of talking about like all these jobs are disappearing and i I immediately thought of all my friends or people i know that sell products on the amazon marketplace Mm -hmm. Uh, you know i don't know anyone that sells products through the walmart marketplace because it you know it's Maybe if you get this certain volume of wholesale, like at some point you could maybe get into Walmart, but being able to sell something on Amazon is very accessible. And so, you know, all this, this revenue that was going to employees in Walmart is still going somewhere like that wealth still exists. It's just going to, you know, entrepreneurs selling products on Amazon's marketplace. You know, I was just talking last night. James uh, James used to live here in the borderless compound. I, I'm still in here where the studio is and everything. The landlord is a gentleman who uh, is an attorney originally from from Texas, but he's been living here for some years. And he was talking about his uh, his son um, going to college. And we were talking about that a little bit. You know, for seven years, I did group consultations, uh, presentations, talking to people about college and college financial aid and things like that. And even back then, we're talking about going back uh, three to 10 years ago during that time period, the subject would come up all of the time. Is it even worth it anymore? And I really don't think that many people want to face it, particularly in the United States. The jobs are just not there. The, The structural changes to the United States, to the economy, you can't find the jobs and you're going deep, deep, deep into debt because of the extraordinary cost for tuition there. Yes, I've seen a lot of people, I've had the same discussion with a lot of people. I think one thing I've started uh, encouraging people to do, and so far no one's taken me up on it, is uh, gap years, which are very common in other countries. But at least for me and for most people I know, college is just such a default option. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you're kind of like middle class, you just have to go to college. Like it was, I remember with my parents, like that wasn't a point of discussion. It was never like, is it, should you go to college? This was like, it was just like kind of an assumed fact. Um, And I do wish in retrospect, I'd taken, taken a year to like work in a small business, um, like travel and work on the road and just like gotten a little bit of like life perspective and maybe come to understand some of these, you know, concepts we're talking about um, before, uh, paying a bunch of money to a university. And I, you know, I wonder if I wouldn't have, um, like wised up and, and seen things before making that investment. And I think, you know, the gap year seems to be a little more tenable to people that have traditional views because they look like, I'm still going to go to college. I'll go ahead and get admitted. I'm just going to postpone for a year, um, and like work on some other projects. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, in a little bit here, what we want to find out is what you're actually doing right now, Taylor, what you're spending your time on other than, you know, letting people interview you on their radio shows and podcasts like this. Uh, But right now we need to take just a moment to give some attention to our sponsor. Today's Borderless podcast being brought to you by The Condescending Group, your online leader in promoting unwarranted self-confidence. Well, you've no doubt heard about the Shemitah prophecies based upon ancient Hebrew religious observances. Well, The Condescending Group thinks that's hogwash, nothing to it at all, they say. But they have pinpointed another set of prophecies due for fulfillment this October 1st. This one is called the Shetita based upon visions revealed to them in a days-long mushroom trip in which one of them saw fire raining from heaven and lizard-headed creatures assuming control of a militaristic one-world government. The Shetita is named after the Mesopotamian word shit, which means bad occurrences, and Ita, which is Akkadian for gonna happen. While many are planning to meet and hold hands on the Golden Gate Bridge, appealing to Marduk to intervene in these imminent world-shaking events, the condescending group says you can seek refuge now by doing these three things. One, assume the twisting tortoise yoga pose. Two, 
chant, deliver me, O Marduk, nonstop, and three, hold up a photograph of Bernie Sanders to the sky. Now, for extra insurance against the lizards, you can also send them $29.95, and the members of the condescending group will send protective love beams to you telepathically during their next mushroom trip. The condescending group, they care more than you. Okay, so we're back with our guest, Taylor Pearson. He is the author of The End of Jobs. We're talking about how things changing and how many people are not prepared for it and how they maybe better get prepared for it. So, you know, one of the things I was going to do, Taylor, is I was going to take you, I was going to talk about, uh, I noticed you had a button on your website, taylorpearson.me, consulting and strategy. And then I noticed right under believe, uh, all of the information on this is you're presently not taking new clients, right? So I take it you're either busy dealing with the fallout from this great success with the book, or you've got enough clients right now. Is that the case? It is. I'm, I'm mainly dealing with uh, the fallout from the book, which was uh, great but unexpected. Mm. Um, so at this moment, have that and um, a couple other projects, uh, book-related, that I'm working on. Mm. Okay. But what what is it that you were doing and maybe will do again that people can hire you as a consultant? So my background is um, digital marketing and then kind of has evolved over the years. The the big thing I do is um, systems consulting um, or kind of work the system for anyone that's familiar with uh, Sam Carpenter's book, um, work with entrepreneurs and businesses that are um, growing usually like um, high six figures to low seven figure businesses and need to put documentation in place. Um, the founder needs to extract himself from the business and kind of go from in the operations to kind of a more CEO overseeing role. And so I, um, I work with business owners to uh, get those systems into place and um, also hire and scale and um, what that looks like. Okay. And uh, so as far as what you're recommending that people do, for instance, one of the things, you, as we've said, we're not really prepared for it. I mean, in prior times throughout history, people were probably a little more flexible. Uh, but we've been kind of hypnotized, I think, for many decades here. I mean, I saw it myself a little bit earlier because I come from Michigan where the auto industry was big. And everybody just thought, oh, you better go knocking on GM's door. Generous Motors, you know, and and of course, they hit the wall here some time ago and they came to see that maybe that wasn't the best course. And what we're seeing in the broader picture here is the concept of pursuing that lifelong job isn't the best course. So they're kind of hypnotized. So uh, I, I noticed a quote from you that said the following, everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you and you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. So I guess, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the, just what it is going to take for people to move from where they are now to where they need to be. So I'll say, first of all, that, that quote is from Steve Jobs. Oh, it I, is. I, 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 thought, I thought that sounded familiar. That's yes, from that I, speech he gave, isn't it? It is. So okay. I, I most certainly cannot take uh, credit okay. for that. <laughs> okay. um, but I, I'll just I, take I, credit. I, I do agree with him. I will give him uh, you know, a plus one and I, I vote for that as well. Um, so... The two paths I see people um, being successful at kind of transitioning from this traditional job-based mentality and model to a more entrepreneurial career path. Um, The first is apprenticeships. Um, This is very much my story, which is, you know, I kind of looked around. I saw like none of these options look so great. And I looked over at some entrepreneurs and I said, that looks pretty cool. I have no idea how that works. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I did was I went to work, you know, I, um, initially working in a marketing agency and went on to run, um, an e-commerce, a portfolio of e-commerce sites for two other entrepreneurs. Um, and basically said, look, you know, I'll, I'll come in here and I'll work really hard. Um, but what happens is like, you know, you kind of, you kind of teach me the, the inner workings. Like you show me the guts of your business. You show me how this whole entrepreneurship thing works. I want to, you know, I want to see how you think. I want to have access to your resources. Um, you know, in exchange for that, I'll work really hard um, and I'll grow your business and I'll, I'll you know, make you, um, make you a lot of money. Um, and so that's kind of you know, like this one route, which is can you find someone um, in your network um, or someone you see online? Or one thing I've pointed people towards is the Inc. 5000 list, which are fast growing small businesses or startups. Like, go get yourself in a position where 
um, you can be in an entrepreneurial environment and still have some of that um, kind of cash flow security or that paycheck security. So you're starting to build this skill set. You're starting to build these more entrepreneurial relationships, um, but you don't have this downside of like making the leap on your own. Um, and then the other path that I talk about in the book that I, I see people be successful at is this idea of stair stepping. You know, when we're talking about like video production used to cost thirty two thousand dollars and now it's an iPhone and YouTube that the ability to start something very small, uh, very inexpensively and with very little time and have that grow into a real asset um, is all of a sudden possible. So if you're in a you know, traditional job or traditional um you know, university or something, can you start some sort of side project, um, some product, um, something you can get moving on the side uh, and eventually scale that into something that can replace um, your existing income? Again, like instead of kind of jumping ship, you know, how can you stair step um, out of whatever situation you're in now if that doesn't look like a good path? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's good advice. You know, I also wanted to talk to you about something else, you know, talk about the, the gift and the curse of living, living in interesting times. And uh, what I thought was interesting was uh, your take on the so-called global recession, global depression that we seem to be going through now, and that you're saying this is not a global recession. What we're actually doing is we're seeing a transition between two distinct economic periods. Uh, I worked in financial newsletters. I've also, you know, sold precious metals. So I've been around kind of a lot of doomsdayers and people that are <clears throat> talking about the economy, that it's, uh, you know, in a very bad situation and it, everything's going to go to hell. So, you know, it seems that you have a completely different view on it. And I think that's good. I actually share that view with you. So uh, I think it's a very refreshing and good, good view to have. So um, anyways, one thing I wanted to kind of ask you about, though, is, you know, how, how do you see, so from what you wrote about the knowledge economy to the entrepreneurial economy, what about all this debt that's been accumulated from, you know, that is a lot of people would say is the main problem with this global recession that we're seeing is just this vast accumulation of debt. How, how is this going to be dealt with? I mean, because that, that's what's really in the way of us going full fledged into this entrepreneurship uh, economy the way I see it. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I wish I had the answer. I don't know. It, it, it does seem like a huge problem. I guess, you know, my my bias is to kind of try and bring things back to the individual. I tend to um, I tend to avoid macroeconomics, probably in large part because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I think also because it kind of ignores this idea of agency. Yeah. The kind of the the story of technology is you know the giving the individual greater agency. But you know. Us, you know, sitting recording this uh, today on our uh, inexpensive equipment versus having to go rent a studio space 30 years ago, we have more agency um, to be able to create and connect and do entrepreneurial things. So, um, you know, what's going to happen with the debt on a macro scale? I, you know, I don't, I don't know, but um, you know, certainly to the extent like you can avoid debt, avoid taking out student loans or credit card loans on an individual level, that certainly seems to be a good idea. And then, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I was a uh, Dave Ramsey was a big influence on me, like setting up those kind of, you know, financial systems to um, get yourself out of debt or manage your debt effectively while you're making, you know, moving into an apprenticeship position or, you know, kind of starting one of these stair step uh, businesses. Yeah. Well, Taylor, don't feel too bad about uh, not knowing what you're talking about on macroeconomic issues. Cause I'll, I'll tell you a secret. Nobody does. <laughs> right. yeah, I, I, I guess I don't say it out loud a lot, but I, I think, the idea of macroeconomics is like an actual field of study is kind of absurd. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I don't know if it's really helpful. I don't know if any, um, anyone gets a lot out of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I get your point. I mean, I, I do see things both ways. I mean, for instance, to the extent that we attach ourselves to any collectivist system, to that extent, we make ourselves vulnerable. That's the big picture of what we're talking about here anyway, whether it's a job or whether it's a government that we feel that we are reliant upon, at the end of the day, as dangerous as that might be, what are you going to do about it? And that action needs to be individual. And uh, speaking of that, you have a quote on your website from William James in which you quote him saying, by forming good habits, we can free our minds to advance to really interesting fields 
of action. Then you have the Aristotle quote, what we are, what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And I suspect that this is going to be something that a lot of people have to learn. And I suppose it helps if people have a cultish obsession with personal productivity systems like you, huh? Uh, it does. I think that was, you know, my, what I, one of the things I quickly realized um, when I kind of moved from the traditional job university script into this more entrepreneurial path was um, people didn't tell you what to do. You had to figure it out yourself, um, which is, which you know, it sounds all good on the front end. And then you realize you've got 130 things that, you know, people ask you over email or whatever, and you got to figure out what to do. And so the book that kind of opened my eyes was um, getting things done by David Allen. And I've since gone on to kind of modify his system um, for myself and my personal use. But yes, I'm, I'm very, um, driven by ritual. Uh, my days look more or less the same. You know, if you follow, if you followed me around with a camera, it would probably be the most boring movie of all time. Mm. Um, and I, I think most, most people I see that are, um, doing, a, producing a lot, creating a lot, connecting a lot, um, are likewise very driven by habits and rituals, um, and setting up kind of those personal systems in their lives to, um, to let them be successful. Right. Yeah, if you don't mind, would you mind walking through your your morning ritual? I see you have that written out in your. Uh, There's website. no way we can get through that, man. <laughs> it's I mean, it's all the way through the day. It's very long. But no, yeah, just the morning. The morning ritual. Yeah, what's the morning ritual? So I'll give you my updated one. I haven't updated that post in about <laughs> okay. uh, six months. So I, I usually wake up. I'm a pretty early riser. I usually get up around six. Um, I'll read for an hour and have some coffee while I read. Um, brush my teeth. Uh, I usually do yoga or some kind of light stretching just to get my blood flowing for five or 10 minutes. Uh, I'll sit down and meditate. Uh, I'll go over kind of, um, a sheet I keep in my Evernote or a note I keep in my Evernote of kind of goals, objectives, what I'm working on broader in life, what I'm working on in business, and then, uh, map out my day, um, figure out what my top three priority tasks are. And I'll like write those down just on a piece of paper that, you know, if everything else, completely goes to waste. Like these are the three things I'm absolutely going to get done. Um, and then sit down and, and usually work for three or four hours first thing in the morning and try to try to keep my phone on airplane mode. I block myself off email, mm -hmm. um, and try and keep that like two to three hour, at least chunk of the morning to really work on the most important things. Um, for me business wise. And then I usually go into kind of responsive mode and everything else later in the day. And you have your bulletproof coffee. Uh, I'm off the bulletproof coffee at you this are. point. Uh, I am too. But I, I ha I've been on and off over the last three years. So I'm you sure still take, you're on. still drinking that in the mornings, John? I am. Yeah. yeah? Uh -huh. About at least three, sometimes four days a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I've been, the, the uh, MCT oil is a little hard to get here. So I've just been using good coconut oil with the butter. Ah, right. Yeah. So, okay. Well, it's interesting to see this, but I think it's it's really, really a point. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, I'm not a particularly scheduled person. And every time I find an especially effective person, it does seem like they say, look, this it's all about these habits, you know. And folks, if you want to go to taylorpearson.me, he's got his daily ritual, which he's tweaked apparently. He's got his morning work. He's got his lunch. He's got his afternoon work, his afternoon break. He's got everything laid out there, everything down to brushing his teeth and getting into bed. <laughs> uh, so it's like, I, I suspect that this is something that particularly for people who are struggling with being more productive and finding their way out of this hypnosis of the old paradigm, we're going to have to get used to trying to create these rituals ourselves. What do you think? I, I do think that's the case. And I think it's, I kind of felt awkward posting that I had people kept asking me, like, oh, what do you like? How do you do your mornings? I was like, well, you know, I just write an article and like, you can go. <laughs> uh, look at it if you want, but I, I do think, um, the more you have to spend your, at least for me, the more I have to spend kind of my, my working hours doing unstructured work where I, like, it's not, no one's telling me what to do. I've got to figure out what to do and figure out how to do it and figure out who I need to bring in. And I've got all these things moving. The more I can kind of ritualize and habitualize everything outside that, you know, I have two shirts, I have two pairs of pants. I you know, don't have to think about what I put on in the morning. I just grab them and, and slip them on. Um, that seems to make me um, more effective. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. So a guy like you that has his whole, uh, his whole day uh, scheduled like that, I mean, do you 
Off, where, let me ask for Where are you right now again? I'm based in Austin, Texas. Austin, oh. Texas. So do you uh, go out in the city in Austin a lot, or are you a guy that usually just stays in the house, go out maybe once in a while? Or uh, I'm about 50-50. Are... I work okay. from home half the time, and then I'll go out to meetings or go to cafes and work. But okay. I don't think James is talking about where you're working. He's talking about where you're playing. I, I am. I love, you know, one of my strange things, I love living in cities with like vibrant nightlife and I don't like participating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love the energy it brings yeah. and like the creativity and all this cool stuff going on. But I, I'm like Saturday night, I'm usually in bed, you know, like 9 30 or 10. So oh, I'm pretty boring. How sad. No, I'm just kidding. Good for you, man. Well, okay, so in, in the book right at the beginning, you talked about The Secret, which uh, you said has kind of changed a lot of people. Uh, you know, they've had tremendous success. I think at the beginning of this interview, you talked about your accountant, uh, or the, our accountant friend, that ch changed kind of a more entrepreneurial uh, outlook on what they were doing, and you said that they'd figured out The Secret. Would you mind sharing what that secret is? So The Secret is kind of a... Uh... The analogy I use in the book for the secret is the idea of uh, a longer lever, that entrepreneurship, you know, if you're going to push hard, and I do think, you know, pushing hard is kind of the required, you know, there is no, like, you know, the no free lunch, whatever quote you want to say, that you do have to certainly work hard, but that being strategic about um, where you invest that work, um, and I think investing that work towards an entrepreneurial path, an entrepreneurial career script um, it's kind of this secret longer lever where um, you can get, you know, much, much better results um, given the amount of work and um, the amount of effort you're putting in over the long term. Yeah. So I guess it's about, you know, it's concentrating your efforts and what you're learning and what you're doing in, you know, different areas. But, you know, using your willpower to, to consciously do this kind of stuff, even with the with the rituals, you know, uh, if you if you're doing things kind of it, the way that you want to do it, if you're concentrating on the subjects that you want to concentrate on, you have to then be self-motivated, which I think a lot of people have problems with. Um, so that's why these uh, rituals or, you know, the, the a schedule day and things like that help. I, you know, people need to get into the, uh, you know, habit of not having anybody over their shoulder telling, telling, uh, shoulder telling them w what to do or what to study or what to be working on, you know, so that, that takes kind of a shift in, in, uh, in mentality. There's actually a great book called daily rituals. Mm -hmm. Um, it was compiled. It's all these, uh, based on letters and interviews with kind of like famous artists and writers and, um, entrepreneurs and creative types, um, over the last 500 years. Uh, and there's a line in it that really stuck with me. It's a writer and I can't recall who it is, but he's, he says, you know, I only write when I'm inspired. Uh, and for, fortunately, inspiration strikes every morning at 9 a.m. Um, <laughs> and that, that seems to be about right for me as well. Very good. I notice in your uh, in your reading list, you've got The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. That's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah. James loaned that one to me. I found yeah. it very helpful. Yeah. Would you mind telling us some of your, the top book recommendations that you have? Uh, so I'd say my biggest influence is um, The War of Art is certainly one. Mm -hmm. uh, Lynchpin. Uh, and Purple Cow, both by Seth Godin. Oh, yeah, Seth Godin. Uh, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. Um, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor mm -hmm. Frankl. Um, Ray Dalio uh, has a PDF. He is the, I guess, CEO of a hedge fund called Bridgewater. Um, it's actually a free PDF. It's not a book, but it's one of the, in terms of just density of um, knowledge and insight, one of the densest things I've ever read. Wow, I'll have to uh, check that out. What's it called? Uh, principles oh, okay. and the guy's name is Ray Dalio. Right. He runs uh, yeah Bridgewater Hedge Fund, which I think at, at one point and this may still be true. They were like it was like the most successful hedge fund for seven. It was some seventeen years in a row. It was something absurd. Mm -hmm. um, and he kind of talks about what the what his principles are and what the company's principles are um, for how they've managed to be so successful for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great books. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put some links to. All these books, plus your book, man. I tell you, uh, you know, Borderless Podcast listeners, if you're into what we're talking about, I would say that uh, Taylor's book is a must read. And I'm going to put a link to that down in the show notes. So, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of something funny. I remember I was looking at your uh, Facebook page. It looks like you had a, uh, 
uh, was it a, a review on Amazon or something? Somebody didn't like your book, I guess. <laughs> they said it sounded like a latent psychopath. What was that all about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was funny, huh? The review referred to me as a latent sociopath. sociopath. Oh, my well, God. Well, I was trying to figure oh. out, what. how did you figure he gets that from your book? Well, it, it, it was interesting. I actually, one of my friends messaged me after I posted that. He had um, Googled the reviewer, and uh, ironically, I have kind of questionable things to say about accountants in the book and very questionable ah. things to say about <laughs> the value of an MBA degree. And so it right. turns out it was an accountant who was back in school for an MBA degree. So the choices <laughs> were either leave a very scathing review of the book or revisit entire life premise. And so I think probably psychologically it was better for her to leave a scathing review of the book. Which, that's you that's know, what you're doing in bustling Austin when you're not partying. You're staying home trying to figure out ways to conquer the world, you sociopath. Yes. Yeah. Oh, now I've been gosh. called out. Yeah. I thought that was funny. <laughs> well, it, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go ahead, James. Uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, you, all the, your whole book and your whole kind of thing is giving, you know, new entrepreneurs advice or people that want to get started in here. I was wondering what the best piece of advice that you have that you would give somebody that's kind of just starting out in this kind of entrepreneurial quest. So I would say the best piece of advice someone ever gave to me, uh, was not very helpful, but very true, which was just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially, you know, for me and for a lot of people I talk to, like those, the first um, kind of the first dabbles into the entrepreneurial pond move very slowly and are sometimes very discouraging. Um, but that, that persistence, um, maybe not with a specific project, but certainly with moving, moving your life in a more entrepreneurial uh, direction uh, does pay off over time. Yeah. Well, that's good advice. Hey, I have a uh, a question I was just thinking about. When was it that so you went with the um, what are the the tropical MBA guys, right? That's how yes. you. Yes. Okay. And did you start with an apprenticeship with them? I did. So they hired okay. me. They used to run. Um, and they don't really do it anymore. Actually, I, I was one of the last ones. They used yeah. to run the apprenticeship programs. Yeah, we've had, uh, so, so we've I had with them mm -hmm. for two years. Okay, we've had three people on the podcast. We've had Sean Ogle. Mm -hmm. Marisa, and then you. So this, you're the third person that's done an, um, an apprenticeship with them who uh, have really talked highly about that. They don't do it anymore. But what I was going to say is I remember when I got out of college and I uh, was trying to figure out what I was going to do, I seriously, I remember that they put out, it was, what was that, 2011 uh, or 12, I can't remember right now. And I was trying to think about what I was going to do. And I saw that they put out, when was, did you go in that, that time range? I started working with them in 2012. Okay. I think that that was the time I was thinking about doing that. I didn't put my, myself in, but I was seriously thinking a lot about doing that. And what I did instead is I worked for Euro Pacific bank, uh, Peter Schiff's bank in, uh, in Barbados. So that oh, was, well, I have a friend that works with Peter Schiff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. that was my decision was between those two things. And I took the, the latter, but uh, I could have very easily went the other way. So it's very interesting. Yeah. I think it's, um, you know, I talk with people about apprenticeships and I'm, that's probably the idea I'm most excited about in the book right now. Actually, I have a, which you mentioned Mark Peters in a Facebook group. I run, I post apprenticeship opportunities in there. Um, if anyone wants to find that you can go, it's uh, taylorpearson.me slash EOJ. Uh, and there's a link to the Facebook group. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's a real opportunity for these kind of like apprenticeship positions to um, supplant or certainly supplement um, a lot of traditional education. So I'm I'm very bullish and very excited about figuring out ways to push that forward. Fantastic. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for coming on. I know you, you got to get rolling here. Taylor Pearson, entrepreneur, marketer, philosopher and author of The End of Jobs. Thank you so much for joining us for the Borderless Podcast. Thank you guys for having me and thanks everyone for listening. So again, thanks to Mark Peters, right, for recommending yep. Taylor Pearson to mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Oh, so, you know what? Let's um let's go over our uh, reviews here for a second. Uh, oh. We, oh, wait, no, we don't have any. A, what the, two weeks in a row? Uh, Listen ass clowns. No, I'm kidding. Totally. No, you guys have been great. And uh, you know, the, the, the podcasts, num I, I see them now. James used to only see that, but I see how they just continue. They're going up since May is when it really, something lit fire to the Borderless mm -hmm. podcast. 
and it's been going up at about a 20 to 25 degree angle ever since. Every week there's more people listening, certainly every month. And so we really, really appreciate it. And and uh, Taylor Pearson was just a perfect guest, yeah. I think, for this Very podcast. Good. And you know what? I got somebody who I think we're going to get next week who I think is going to be perfect as well. Good. But yeah, about uh, you know growing the audience. Uh, you know, if you guys enjoy this, if you could just remember to share it, you know, let other people know. I'd like to, to you know, broaden the, the reach of this podcast. I want to have a, a much bigger audience here, and that way we can all, you know, help each other uh, in kind of trying to move to different markets, um, you know, maybe different areas and this type of stuff. The more people we have involved, uh, the more powerful our uh, network will be. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you probably would enjoy access to our private Facebook page. Go to borderlesspodcast.com. And uh, you click on the button which says free instant access, free instant access. And we will get you in on that. Plus, mm-hmm. you'll get a, uh, an informational thing yeah. about yeah, you got a PDF, mm-hmm. right? PDF. And the other thing is we've got, of course, what's the big news, James? The Borderless Society. Oh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> this thing you've been working on for yeah, months. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And yeah, that's right. And we have the Borderless Society. If you are ready to, uh, you know, take the leap and you want to, you know, a little more uh, confident about it than just joining a, a, our free Facebook group, then we do have a membership site and uh, there are people that don't necessarily want to be on Facebook that are on there. There's also a whole lot of instructional videos that are updated every month and uh, that's going to be growing. We're going to be offering a lot more services and a lot more things in there. So mm-hmm. again, you know, the more just like the, uh, you know, the, the Facebook group and the other things that we're doing, the more people that we get on that, the paid membership site, the more powerful it, it, it will be and the more we can afford to put more services and, and things like that on there. So Right. So a, a number of people have already joined. Mm-hmm. Many of them decided to go ahead and just pay for a year. So we appreciate your confidence yep. in this community that's growing. And yeah, thanks. It's been a, it's been a very encouraging, uh, you know, first week. It's only been uh, maybe a little bit over a week now since we've had it. So thanks a lot for everybody that's done it. It really uh, means a lot. All right. And James is working on the forum Mm-hmm. Which and by the way, thank you so very much to our friend who is he is he is commenting more than James and I maybe combined. <laughs> right, T- uh, Terrence Stamp. Terrence, yes, right. Terrence Stamp. Thank you so much for your enthusiastic involvement there, and everybody else that's been going in there. And James is working on uh, uh, maybe a few more features. It could be that we make that a little more dynamic mm-hmm. in, the, in the forum too. Yeah. All right. So another borderless podcast will be coming up soon. Thanks for joining us for the Borderless Podcast. Traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.